much. Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's first meeting in 2015? I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Um, the, item 1, the committees are invited to agree to consider items 7, 8 and 9, which are draft reports on the Modern Slavery LCM, the Prison Monitoring Order and the Assisted Suicide Bill in private. Are you agreed? Thank you very much. Item 2, we've got to uh, move on to consider one affirmative instrument, the draft advice and assistance by way of representation, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015. And I welcome the meeting and wish a happy new year to Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and Denise Swanson, Head of Access to Justice Unit, and Alistair Smith, Directorate for Legal Services, the Scottish Government. I believe you want to make a brief opening it's statement, as this is a pretty self-explanatory piece of subordinate <laughs> legislation, Minister. But I'm feeling kind this morning, so one minute, I think, will be sufficient. Thank you very much I mean. for that late, late Christmas present. Um, and Happy New Year, everybody. No deviation. And, yes, thank you. Repetition or whatever. <laughs> thank you, yes. There are uh, th three affirmative orders uh, being made under the regulation of investigative yeah, powers. Um, no. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. The order just, the first, just the first. Just the first. Apologies, convener. My folder is in the wrong order. Um, if, if we may, this will be very brief. Yeah. Um, the the uh, Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 makes amendments to the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. Uh, the amendments make provision for a pre-hearing panel to determine whether an individual who was previously deemed to be a relevant person uh, should continue in that role. Now, these regulations make consequential amendments to the advice and assistance, uh, assistance by way of Representation Scotland Regulations 2003. The amendments ensure that children and relevant persons will have access to ABWAR where pre-hearing panel is considering whether an individual should continue to be a relevant person. The Justice Committee will wish to note that stakeholders are supportive of these changes. I understand that Law Society of Scotland has written directly to the committee to confirm its support. And these amendments also ensure that access to justice is maintained uh, at the right time and for those who need it most. Thank you very much, Convener. That's all I have. To yes, I, I mean, I think... I'd, uh, are there any questions on this? Because I think it's pretty self expanding and seems an absolutely sensible thing to do uh, to give people the right to representation in these very um, important circumstances. Um, so I'm now moving on to item three, subordinate legislation, the formal debate and the motion to approve the instrument considered and that previous night. I invite the Minister to move S4M 11913 that the Justice Committee recommends draft advice assistance, assistance by way of representation of Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 be approved. Formally moved, Convener. Do any members wish to speak in the debate? No. <clears throat> uh, the question is that uh, S4M 11913 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. As members are aware, we're required to report on all affirmative instruments. Are you content to delegate authority to me to sign off this report? Thank you. <laughs> Item 4. There are three further affirmative instruments. There's a different kettle of fish here. The Draft Regulation of Investigative Powers, Covert Surveillance and Property Interference Code of Practice, Scotland Order 2015. The Draft Regulator of Investigatory Powers, Modification of Authorisation Provisions, Legal Consultation, Scotland Order 2015. And the Draft Regulation of Investigative Powers, Covert Human Intelligence Sources, Code of Practice, Scotland Order 2015. And, uh, Minister, you're still here, and I'll let the seamless transition and changeover of officials. And I welcome Graham Wall, Investigative Powers Team Police Division, and Kevin Gibson, Directorate for Legal Services. And Minister, do you want to make a statement, an opening statement? If, if we'll get it right this time, Convener. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, there are three affirmative orders being made under the Regulation of Investigative Powers Scotland Act before the committee today. It's worth pointing out at the outset that there is nothing in the orders which provides any public authority with additional powers. I will begin, if I may, uh, with the regulation of investigative powers, modification of authorisation provisions, legal consultation, Scotland Order 2015. In 2010, the House of Lords, in considering an appeal from the Divisional Court in Northern Ireland, agreed with the Court's decision that directed surveillance under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000 of communications between lawyers and their clients breached Article 8, the right uh, to respect for private and family life of the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. The uh, Secretary of State did not challenge the decision of the Divisional Court that the procedures used to authorise directed surveillance were disproportionate to the infringement of an individual's right to a private consultation with a lawyer, particularly given the lack of a requirement for independent and high-level scrutiny of such authorisations. In Scotland, the authorisation of directed surveillance is mostly regulated by the uh, Regulation of Investigative Powers, Scotland Act 2000, or RIPSA, and the relevant provisions of that legislation are, for relevant purposes, the same as those successful 
previously challenged in the House of Lords. It is therefore necessary to adjust the authorising regime for directed surveillance of legal consultations under RIPSA. RIPSA contains provisions which allow Scottish ministers to reclassify particular types of directed uh, surveillance as if they were intrusive surveillance. That reclassification has three main effects, which operate to restrict the use of directed surveillance in defined cases, as well as enhancing independent oversight of the process. Firstly, it narrows the circumstances in which directed surveillance can be used to those where it is necessary to prevent or detect serious crime. Secondly, it restricts the office holders who can authorise such surveillance to the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland or any other senior officer designated by him, and to the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. And thirdly, it requires notification of authorisation to be given to an ordinary surveillance com commissioner and prevents that authorisation taking effect unless the commissioner approves it. A commissioner will only provide that approval if he or she feels that the authorised surveillance activity is both necessary and proportionate. The committee is today also considering a fourth negative order being made under RIPSA. I would like to very briefly say that one of the things the negative order seeks to do is to put in place a similar framework to the one I've just described with regard to the authorisation of covert human intelligence sources whose activity may involve matters subject to legal confidentiality. Again, this represents a significant tightening up on existing arrangements. The two remaining affirmative orders, the regulation of investigative powers, covert surveillance and property interference, Code of Practice Scotland, Order 2015 and the Regulation of Investigatory Powers, Covert Human Intelligence Sources, Code of Practice, Scotland Order 2015, are technical in nature. Their purpose is to put in place the revised codes for covert surveillance and property interference and covert human intelligence sources and to revoke the existing codes that were published in 2002. A number of changes have taken place since the codes were last published in 2002, as well as uh, reflecting uh, the issues around legal confidentiality and undercover operatives that the committee is considering today. The codes reflect a number of organisational changes that have taken place in the last 12 years. Not least of these, of course, is the amalgamation of Scotland's police forces into the single police service of Scotland. Thank you, convener, for your Thank the you opportunity. Thank you very much. And I know you've made reference to item six, which is fine, which is the negative instrument. I've got John Finney. Thank you very and much, then Alison McInnes. Thank and you. Then uh, Rod. Uh, morning, Minister. Uh, I, I know that you say there's no additional powers, but you, you will be aware, Minister, of the significant public concern there is about the level of surveillance that exists in, in Scotland. What reassurance, if any, can you give that these um, changes will be adhered to by UK bodies, so the UK um, security services and any UK police services, as distinct from Scottish? Well, cl clearly... Um, what we have is a regime in place that uh, would ensure that the opportunities to use the surveillance is only when it's proportionate and necessary and in relation to serious crime in, in some cases. So uh, we have um, uh, clearly established uh, procedures which are already working uh, elsewhere in, the, in these islands in terms of other jurisdictions which have, have had time to bed in in, in, in some respects and uh, we believe are working effectively uh, and uh, there's no concerns being raised so far, at least uh, in relation to uh, our, our own knowledge that, that these have been abused in, uh, by other bodies outside of Scotland. So I, I, I very much um, uh, note the point that the member has made and uh, identify with the concerns. We need to be seen to be acting proportionately and where this is necessary and not to, um, to use them in, in situations other, out with that, that, that definition. Um, and uh, I would uh, be uh, happy, obviously, to, to keep uh, a close eye on, on how this operates in practice uh, and see if there are any concerns that arise in, in due course. OK, thank you. I, I wonder, can I, I, I raise um, a number of issues regarding the letter from the Faculty of Advocates that you'll be aware of, Minister? Um, um, it does note that, uh, uh, and I quote from... Uh, the second page of it, the grounds upon which the powers may be exercised are more limited than the powers under the equivalent UK orders, and that too is welcome. So again, it's against that background that it is a tighter regime in Scotland, you, you would acknowledge. Yes, and you know, it's very much the point I emphasised out, out uh, sort of my remarks, that we are uh, you know, certainly not giving any additional powers to investigatory uh, authorities. What we're doing is tightening up the um, actual delivery of this in practice and making sure that it is uh, compliant with the decision that was uh, taken in relation to what happened in Northern Ireland. So we are, um, it's our own approach uh, to, to this particular issue, uh, but we're satisfied that we are taking a, a, um, a robust approach to ensuring that it is properly uh, overs overseen by the, uh, by the Commissioner. 
and indeed by the police themselves. I, I imagine it would be argued that any prosecution which relied on this level of surveillance that didn't comply fully with the procedures in Scotland would be, found, uh, you know, would be flawed. How would the Scottish <coughs> Government respond if it transpired that there was any activity at UK level where this procedure hadn't been followed, where, for instance, there was a prosecution out with Scotland's jurisdiction? Well, clearly, we have ongoing dialogue with colleagues across the UK um, in, in relation to the operation of such, such matters and to learn from experience elsewhere. And similarly, they'll be learning from, from ourselves in terms of how we deliver this, I'm sure. Uh, and if matters do come to light that, uh, that there are concerns about the implementation of this elsewhere in the UK that might have implications for our own uh, approach and framework we have in Scotland, then clearly we would need to take that on board. So uh, I would uh, certainly uh, you know, give, my, give my own undertaking that uh, if issues did come to light, then I would look again at, at, the, at the procedures. But um, we're confident that what we have in front of the committee today uh, is an appropriate approach to tackling the issue that was, that was brought forward in relation to the, the court case um, uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and this um, uh, will make sure that the legislation in Scotland is compliant with the ECHR in respect to these matters. Okay, and on that particular uh, court case which hinged on uh, legal professional privilege and, and accepting the, the issue of inequity, the exception there, the, the Faculty of Advocates say, uh, and I again quote from them, the issue is accordingly not only of interest to lawyers and to those who seek the advice of lawyers, whether in the context of civil or criminal matters, but is of structural importance in a constitutional democracy governed by the rule of law. They then go on to say it's evidently intended that surveillance under SSIs may be authorised even in circumstances which would not engage the inequity exception. Is, is it not a matter of grave concern when a body of lawyers speak as strongly about the issue as that? Well, I certainly respect the, the views that have been expressed by uh, Mr. Wolf on behalf of the, the, the Faculty of Advocates. And, um, you know, we, what we have done is we believe we had a choice as to how we, we take this issue forward. Um, do we uh, give clarity to legal professionals and those using legal services as to the uh, circumstances in terms of the, the premises or location in which they can be clear that they will have a higher test being applied to the use of uh, surveillance in relation to um, their, their, their privacy. Uh, and they, we believe the approach we've taken will give that clarity so their legal advisor will be able to tell their client uh, that they, if they're conducting their discussions in, the, in their legal premises, they will have additional degree of uh, scrutiny applied to any application that we've made to undertake surveillance uh, in relation to that conversation. Whereas if we would have faced a difficulty, a very practical difficulty, if we didn't define it in relation to the location of where this advice was being given uh, about how we would um, you know, know in advance of a conversation taking place that it was of a legal nature and therefore subject to that test. So uh, we're giving... Uh, we're having to wrestle with an issue about the practicality of delivery of this um, uh, important principle uh, I very much recognise in Mr Wolfe's comments about the public having trust that there is confidentiality of the advice they're getting and, and the comments they're giving to their solicitor. totally respect that position, uh, but we have to, to try and help uh, ensure that there is a practical solution to the use of surveillance and ensure that um, you know, we give clarity to those who may be affected by this uh, by, by setting out in, in, in the legislation where uh, the higher test would apply um, and, and get around the problem that we would have a real difficulty in identifying in advance of a conversation taking place, whether it was about a legal matter, whether it was about the, the, the criminality that we're trying to identify. Would you envisage more use of the, the, this legislation than given that uh, it, it is intended for the purpose of preventing or detecting serious crime, which the, the, the police would say is their entire reason d'etre? Well, I mean, what I would say in relation to, to this uh, is that, you know, what we, we require is a set of circumstances where we can authorise such activity where it is necessary and proportionate and where it, clearly we're defining here in relation to serious crimes uh, or the risk of serious crimes or public safety uh, being at risk in, in other respects. Um, so, you know, I would hope that by the fact we're, we're tightening up the, the requirements here in terms of authorisation before such techniques are deployed. Uh, that in, in reality, unless there is a, an increase in the underlying uh, need for this uh, surveillance to take place in terms of the increased prevalence of serious crime, which I hope, and I'm sure all members of the committee would hope will not happen, that there would not ne need to be an increase in the use of surveillance as a result of this. Indeed, it's tightening up the requirements 
uh, to, to deploy uh, such, such surveillance to make it more difficult and you know, have to go through more checks and balances to make sure that uh, it's properly scrutinised before it is deployed. So I would hope it will give people confidence in the wider community um, that an appropriate uh, approach is being taken here to making sure that this surveillance techniques and the use of uh, human resources as well in terms of uh, informants and others is only being deployed uh, where it's necessary and proportionate to the, to the crimes that are believed to be undertaken. Thank you. Just one final question, if I may, convener. Can you just go through the practicalities of, you know, let's stick with the lawyer confidentiality about whether there's a real test of human rights and, and confidentiality and, and privilege. How would this operate? Who would apply to the commissioner? What kind of evidence would be put before them? How would it be set about? I mean, you're trying to make sure, I think, there's not a fishing expedition. The committee wouldn't want somebody just to be, you know, without there being due cause to be doing it. So could we maybe just go through how it works? That would be helpful to me, I think. So it, it, Police Scotland think this person's up to serious crime. They're going away to talk to their lawyer or they're in prison going to talk to their lawyer. How do the, how, what's the process then? Well, um, we, we, we certainly know that, you know, clearly consultation with a lawyer can happen in a number of different situations. The process of getting to being able to do this covert okay. surveillance. Well, um, we, we require, um, we certainly require in, in terms of the uh, authorisation that there's an enhanced degree of oversight, obviously, in terms of the, the Office of Surveillance Commissioners. Um, but the, if an investigation requires a degree of surveillance or uh, the necessary to, to enter premises and under the other um, uh, statute... Sorry, submit. Minister, I just want to sure. go to the lawyer a bit so that, you know, who goes to whom, presents what, when does the authorisation go and how is it done? Well, I'll, I'll bring in Graham Walker, if, yes, if I may, I mean, I'll go through the, the, the chapter and verse about how that procedure works. OK, so we're, we're talking about serious crime, so by the point that the police will be thinking about seeking an authorisation. They will have a body of information and intelligence to hand that they will be required to put into an application form that clearly sets out why they believe it is, first of all, necessary. And that will give background to the individual that they're interested in and what that individual's activities entail. Once they've set out why they feel it's ne necessary, they will then go on to set it out why they feel it's proportionate to do that. And that will require them to explain that this is the only way that they can get the information, that they've tried other methods, that those methods have failed or they're just impractical. That then goes to the authorising officer. In this case, the authorising, the authorising officer will be the chief constable or one of the chief constable's designated officers. The designate, if it goes to a designated officer, that will be an ACC or above. If the authorising officer is content with the application form, they will authorise the surveillance. That will then be transmitted to the Office of Surveillance Commissioners, who will require to approve it before any surveillance can take place. People. The Office of Surveillance Commissioners is an independent, judicially-led body. Um, they're based in London, but they cover the entire UK. The commissioners and the chief commissioners are appointed under both RIPA, the UK Act, and RIPSA, the equivalent Scottish Act. And they are basically there to oversee that any yeah. use... Exactly. The Chief Surveillance Commissioner is an ex-High Court judge. Okay, right. Um, um, the, there are two commissioners who provide knowledge of Scots law. That's Lord Bonamy and Lord Maclean, right. are the current, what we call our Scottish commissioners. Um, so it's a fairly high level of judicial oversight that's applied. And they will reassure themselves that they're content with the necessity and proportionality before they give the OK, if you like, for the surveillance to take place. And the, and the lawyer will be unaware this is happening? Yes. As will obviously his client or her client? Yes. OK, that was helpful. Just wanted to see how, how it worked in practical terms. Um, Alison. Oh, sorry, yes. John, yes. Th thank you, Commissioner. A, a very final brief question. It's about the impact assessment, Minister. Um, what we're told here is there are no equality impact issues and an EQIA has therefore not been completed, it is extremely unlikely that any particular group will be impacted by the provisions contained in the code. G given the work that's often taken covertly at UK level, I mean, it, was that genuinely the belief? 
Well, I think I'd go back to the, the, the original point. We're not giving any additional powers here to the investigative authorities. We're actually, if anything, making it, you know, tightening up here the, the regulation of uh, the, these powers. Uh, so we're not putting anyone at any disadvantage. It's making it, if you like, harder and, and, and applying a higher test to the use of these surveillance technologies and, and indeed, use of uh, uh, human uh, resources as well. So. I, I don't. I mean, it would be helpful if, if Mr. Finney might explain why, why he's concerned about the quality's impact uh, issue there, because uh, maybe I'm just mis misreading what he's, he's saying. Well, if the existing arrangements disproportionately impact in a certain category, and I'm thinking of young Muslim men, then mm -hmm. the new arrangements, whilst they might not, um, you know, additionally impact it still would be a disproportionate impact on ah, that group. Right. OK, I, I understand the point Mr Finney is making. Um, I would turn to the point, though, that this is, uh, this is not changing the, the landscape in terms of additional powers that might be required uh, to perhaps... I could understand the point in terms of if it was going to increase the, the likelihood that someone who was uh, perhaps uh, of Islamic faith might be targeted for, for surveillance for a particular reason. This um, is, is, if you like, uh, as a level playing field in a sense. It's if this is affecting everybody equally, and regardless of whether their background, if they are suspected of, of, of a serious crime, um, then they would be uh, subject to um, the, the, the test in any case. But we have um, a higher test being applied here for the use of surveillance, uh, the deployment of surveillance, and ensuring that it is uh, applying a higher degree of certainty that this is necessary and proportionate. So I would hope it would actually improve the targeting of this, and it was um, you know, more, more uh, evident that it was necessary and proportionate to use surveillance in each and every case it was deployed, rather than it is at the moment. So the impact, if you like, would hopefully be a positive one rather than a negative one. That would be my interpretation. Um, but I appreciate the point that Mr Finney is making, and I'm certainly very mindful of the fact that we, we want to avoid any situation where we seem to be um, unfairly treating any particular group within society. Well, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, I'm not questioning the bona fides of the Scottish Government in relation to this. I'm just wondering how realistic it is to have this tight regime apply to bodies over which the Scottish Government, indeed the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal, the Lord Advocate who's responsible for the investigation of crime, has no direct control, and that is the UK bodies. Yeah, Thank I, you I appreciate much. the point that Mr Finney's making. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Alison, followed by Roderick. Thank you. I mean, the client lawyer privilege is, is a fundamental right, and we already have the inequity provision, which is appropriate, and that allows covert surveillance where um, the, the privilege is being abused for, for, for criminal purposes. But the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates does argue that this goes further than that. Um, and I think we should only be straying from this in compelling and, I think, exceptional circumstances. But, Minister, you've talked about um, if there's a concern about serious crime. Now, the debate in the United Kingdom at Westminster was round about national security or threat to life. Uh, you've widened that out to um, serious crime, as far as I can hear. Um, can you give me some examples of where you think this would uh, be appropriate to, to take a um, if you uh, bear with me, uh, convener, I am just going to get my notes. Uh, I think the, um, the point is, uh, is understood. We, we appreciate the point that is being made by um, Mr Wolfe uh, in relation to uh, the, um, uh, the, the use and the, the broadening this out. It's worth stating that serious crime is defined in statute, and if I could maybe just yes. relay this to, to, to the committee, that gives a hopefully a degree of clarity about what we mean. Um, serious crime is uh, defined uh, in terms of um, legislation as references to crime or references to conduct which constitutes one or more criminal offences or is or corresponds to any conduct which, if at, all, if it at all took place in any one part of the United Kingdom, would constitute one or more criminal offences and, uh, Part B, uh, of 31 uh, Section 6 of... Uh, which, in the RIPS Act 2000, uh, re references to serious crime are references to crime that satisfies the test in subsection 7, A or B below. Those tests are, uh, part A is that um, the offence or one of the offences that is or would be constituted by the conduct is an offence for which a person who has attained the age of 21 and has no previous convictions could reasonably be expected to be sentenced to imprisonment for a term of three years or more, or B, that the conduct involves the use of violence, results 
in substantial financial gain or as uh, conduct by a large number of persons in pursuit of a common purpose. Uh, I think it's just worth putting that on, on record as, as the definition of what constitutes serious crime. I do take the point um, Alison McInnes makes about different definitions being used at UK level and the, on, on the Scottish level. Uh, we believe um, that this is proportionate. Um, we uh, believe that uh, similar measures um, have been tested um, uh, in, through, the, through the courts already in terms of a, a GR of uh, uh, RIPA has already been undertaken and, and similar approach has been taken so far. I may be bringing Kevin Gibson on this point, uh, if I may convene her shortly. Um, but that, that this has stood up in terms of its application in relation to uh, ECHR. Um, so that we, we do believe that we're bringing forward a package today to the committee that is uh, compliant with ECHR, uh, is proportionate and um, uh, satisfies the, the necessary adjustments we need to make in light of the court decision in Northern Ireland. But if I could maybe bring in Kevin yes. uh, Gibson, perhaps on this point. I mean, I don't actually have a great deal to add to that, I have to say. Um, the, the test in the UK legislation, the, the, the national security aspect of that is an additional element in the UK legislation. Um, they also deal with serious crime in the same way that we do. So, if you like, they can authorise uh, this type of surveillance in relation to national security and serious crime, whereas, for obvious reasons, we can only do it in relation to, uh, in, in relation to serious crime. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, <clears throat> at Westminster, assurances were given to my colleague, Baroness Hamwe, that such information obtained can only be used to counter a threat um, and not for criminal proceedings. Uh, do you give the same assurance here uh, to, to committee? Uh, well, what we can say is that in relation to the approach in Scotland, the codes of practice require this type of directed surveillance is only be to, to be used in compelling circumstances, such as where there is a threat to life or a threat to life or limb. So um, I hope that gives a sense as to the, if you like, the gravity of the potential crime that might be, uh, might be uh, assessed to be a risk of before it is, is deployed. Um, and so, therefore, I think you know that uh, while, while the, the terminology used may differ in, in, in some respects, that a similar uh, high, uh, high test, if you like, is being applied to uh, the deployment of surveillance. My well, well, point is, Minister, that, that information obtained by this um, intrusive surveillance of the client lawyer privilege should only be used to counter the immediate threat to life and not for further criminal proceedings. Are you able to give that a guarantee? I, I, I believe that is the case, but I've just checked with uh, Graham Walker. That is the intent of the, uh, the approach that's been set out. That is the intent, yes. You use surely evidence obtained under this covert surveillance in criminal proceedings in court because the person's not being made aware of the rights. Surely you're just using it for investigatory purposes and yeah. thereafter whatever is achieved. Is, is that not the point as well? I, th I think that ties in very well with the point that's been made about life or limb. The threat, obviously, if it's used to, to help prevent an immediate threat to, to someone's life or, or, or limb, then, then that's, uh, I think, a legitimate use of Yes, but of not in court proceedings. In, uh, yes, that's what, that's what I'm uh, confirming, a Convener. key demarcation line there between you know, the, the person being aware of the rights to be silent... <laughs> And so I'm just asking, you can't use that evidence. It can't seep in to court proceedings, um, trials, well, surely. I, if I can maybe defer to, to Ke Kevin on, uh, on this issue in terms of the legal position, but my, that's my understanding, Kimura, but just to, to clarify. I that. mean, yeah, it's very unlikely you'd be able to use it in criminal proceedings for, if for no other reason than the fact that it's legally privileged information. Thank you. I just want to clarify, and that was part of the point, mate. Roderick. I refer to my registered interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates. Um, Minister, reading or the, the uh, submission from the Faculty, um, I read it as uh, the Faculty taking the view that the, uh, uh, as quoting, question whether the statute instruments draw the boundary sufficiently tightly, given the importance of lawyer-client uh, confidentiality. And Mr Wolfe, in his submission, goes on to make the point that where there is a reasonable apprehension that the iniquity exception applies in relation to serious crime, the surveillance or the use of the source may, of course, be characterised as necessary for the purpose of preventing or detecting serious crime. So, accepting that that's kind of necessary and proportionate. But the, then he goes on to say the converse is not necessarily true. Uh, indeed, the draft code of pro practice states legal privilege does not apply to communications made with the intention of furthering a criminal purpose. So, 
I read it as a concern about a, a theoretical position where there uh, would be a lack of reasonable apprehension. But I'm wondering in a practical sense to what extent, if it was felt that there were such issues, the, the draft code of practice could be kept under review and, and kind of uh, to, to what extent, if at all, there is any kind of accountability as to the operation of this. Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, Roger Campbell and indeed the, the uh, Faculty of Advocates um, have raised important issues. I mean, I do accept, and the point I was making in relation to Mr. Finney's comments earlier on as well, the importance of protecting the, uh, the, the trust that there is between a lawyer and their, and their client and the degree to which the, the system depends on, on that trust. So I do respect very much the opinion that has been put forward um, by um, Mr. Wolf, by yourself, uh, Mr. Campbell, and, and indeed Mr. Finney, in, in relation to, to this issue. Um, we, we obviously have a situation where uh, there may be circumstances where um, the, the operational requirements that, uh, that you know, require a, a surveillance operation to be undertaken may not actually be focused on the lawyer or indeed the legal communications at all. And so the point I was making earlier on, probably in a ham-fisted way to Mr Finney, was there are circumstances under which um, <clears throat> you, know, you, you have to define, uh, you have a choice between uh, you know, looking at it from the point of view of the premises or location in which the advice has been given versus the, the general principle that you, know, you could particularly do surveillance at any time and, and whether you uh, need to um, uh, have the regulations that work uh, on a non property uh, specific basis. Um, but the activity itself perhaps uh, will nevertheless result in at some point um, privileged communications being obtained um, inadvertently as a result of regulation. We are seeking to create a regime which allows the operational requirement, as I said, to be achieved, um, while at the same time acknowledging that a higher level of protection needs to be uh, afforded to the matters which are subject to legal confidentiality. So that we, we are doing um, I suppose in a nutshell, that the best we feel we can to try and protect the rights of the individual and the, the necessity to protect the confidential, confidentiality of legal advice, except in very unusual circumstances where something like a, a serious crime is being, uh, uh, is being undertaken or planned. Um, and um, I would hope that we can uh, obviously keep under review the, the operation of these uh, code of practices and if there are concerns about how they are being deployed in practice, the, the techniques being deployed in practice, then we can reflect on that. So I do take the point. Uh, we're making the best stab, essentially, we can, we feel at this moment in time, at tackling the issue at hand. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, set in stone. If, if, if it transpires, there are difficulties, and clearly we'll listen to representations from the legal profession and, and other stakeholders if there needs to be modifications and address those in due course. Thank you, Mr. I'm grateful for, for that reassurance. Uh, I think it's as well to stress that I think the faculty's evidence is that these regulations are an improvement on the existing state of play. It's just a yeah, concern whether they're... Shouldn't lose sight of that. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that, the thing that concerns me, and I know when the legislation went through, first of all, which um, I wanted to try for an amendment in, which I failed with, as usual, but was how would you know that you'd been under surveillance? I mean, you're telling me, you know, we're going to keep it under review. But how would a lawyer, uh, let's go back to lawyer-client confidentiality, how would they know? They wouldn't know they'd been under surveillance and it, it all turned out to be wrong and it was misapplied. I mean, who guards the guards here at the end of the day? Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity to raise the point. I mean, the Office of Surveillance Commissioner will obviously have uh, access to uh, knowledge about the extent to which this is being deployed by all the different relevant bodies that can deploy surveillance. So they effectively are a repository of what is happening on the ground. Um, they can obviously keep an eye on the, the practice and if they have concerns, then clearly um, they, they would plan to, I imagine, to, to review the deployment of surveillance under these guidelines. Um, in Tell course. the people, I mean, would they have the faculties concerned and I agree with I see Roddy's quite right. This is a tightening up and it's welcomed by the Dean and they didn't object with the previous Dean and this is kind of late in the day. I understand that. But, you know, you're asking, you've got the office of the Commissioner looking at it to say, well, no, I don't think that was appropriate at that stage. But then the other people, nobody else knows. Yep. Or do they? Uh, well, I think, I think it's worth... Do we get told? Is there, any, is there any data here that tells us where, you know, it's been misapplied or is that something that's secret? It's, it's not necessarily secret. Um, I think the, um, 
the point about the data as to, to how often this is being deployed and what circumstances and how appropriate it is, it's worth reminding uh, the committee that um, clearly the, the commissioner uh, can refuse an application. So if they feel it's in, inappropriate, then the, I would hope that they would, they would, they would um, take necessary action to, to, uh, to refuse an inappropriate application uh, for, for surveillance. But clearly they're monitoring what in effect they regarded as, uh, as necessary and proportionate use of surveillance. Uh, and can keep under, uh, under review the, the data so they'll understand to what extent there's uh, any trend, if there is a trend indeed, in the deployment of this uh, over time to pick up Mr Finney's earlier point and perhaps what groups of people it is being, uh, are being affected. We, we don't have access to, to that information uh, to be able to monitor that ourselves, uh, I'm aware of at least. Um, so we rely a lot on the, the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner. It's what they're charged to do is to, to ensure that there's uh, probity, if you like, in the use of... Of, of surveillance. What the Office of the Commissioner has said or done or evaluated, we wouldn't know that. I understand you've got yep. to protect serious criminal investigations. I understand that. But it's a balance here. I, I agree, Convener. There obviously is a balance. But maybe I don't know whether Graham Moore can add anything on the, on the relationship in terms of how the Commissioner can review this information and to what degree they can, they can ascertain yes. uh, the, the probability of it. There's two aspects to the Commissioner's role here. The first aspect is one I described earlier, where he requires to either approve or quash an application. Um, the second aspect is one of annual inspection. So Police Scotland will be inspected every year um, by an, um, commissioners, probably some of the commissioners inspectors, and they will go through the various paperwork and reassure themselves that everything is as it should be. If they have any recommendations to make on their findings, they will make those to the Chief Constable, and Chief Constable will, will be obliged to, to remedy those. On the, the matter about your point about whether people will know that they've been subject of surveillance, I suppose the answer to that will be, well, if it's been done properly, then no, they won't. Um, but anyone who feels that they've been subjected to unlawful surveillance, and they've got any suspicion that they've been you know, surveilled illegally, um, there is an, a body called Investigatory Powers Tribunal that they can appeal to, and that tribunal would, would take forward their complaint and respond accordingly. And have there been any applications to it? Uh, the tribunal's um, established under RIPA and RIPSA, and there's been a number of appeals to it um, since it was established back in <clears throat> 2000. Um, it's got a, a website that lists its, its various um, cases and the decisions that it's made. There have... I would, I couldn't put a number on it. No, but no. we can find out. Yes. Just, yeah, OK. Just wanted to pursue that point. I'm sorry, I've got Margaret. I didn't notice it. Margaret, Elaine and John, but I'll take the others first, which have been in a long time. Margaret and Elaine, please. Good morning, Minister. I mean, obviously, this is a, a fundamental right, the, the client and, and lawyer privilege. Uh, and I think it's right that colleagues have been um, quite robust in, in questioning you this morning, Minister. However, much has been made of Mr. Wolfe's late submission. I note he didn't, um, he didn't um, take the opportunity to take part in the consultation. And no one's really mentioned the fact that there were, I think, seven consultees, none, none of them opposed this. They included the Law Society, um, the Inspector of Constabulary, Police Scotland, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and the information, of com information commissioner plus two others who wanted to remain anonymous. Um, so I think that's quite significant in itself. Also, I, I think I took totally on board your point in your opening statement, Minister, where you said that um, where the test that was suggested by Mr. Wolf to be applied, that's a reasonable basis for apprehending that legally privileged communication is made with the intention of furthering a criminal purpose or the lawyer is himself party to criminal activity. It's practically impossible to, to determine that in advance. So I think on the basis then, the proportionate, the explanation of compelling being a risk to life or limb um, means that I think the, the government has done a good job in, in really striking the right balance and giving the, the protection necessary in what's a very serious um, situation. Thank you for that. Happy New Year, Minister. Um, Happy New Year. I know, like uh, Margaret mentioned before me, I noted that 
you know, the majority of respondents had not actually raised this concern, this particular concern from Mr Wolfe came in fairly late in the day. However, um, the letter to us is dated the 9th of December, and he says in it that he'd raised the issue with the appropriate official in the Justice Department and copied the letter to uh, Mr Matheson. I wondered if there had, I know it's been the Christmas period, but had been any opportunity to respond to Mr Wolfe and whether or not you'd had any indication from him whether he had been reassured by any response from you. Um, I, if I may direct that to, to Graham Walker, who I believe is the official being referred to in the, in the letter convener. Um, I'm not aware of any feedback being given to the faculty, but maybe Graham can... No, Mr. Mr Wolfe called me a day or so before you received his letter to, first of all, apologise for having missed the consultation, and secondly, just to let us know that he would be writing to the committee. Um, there was a general conversation between he and I about what the legislation was trying to do, and I think his thoughts were very much as set, set out in his letter. He accepted that what we were doing was a significant tightening up, but he still had his professional concern that was set out in his letter. There, there hasn't been uh, an official written response to him. Right. Okay. Uh in terms of the UK legislation, I mean, notice we have actually, this legislation is tighter than the, the, the UK legislation. In terms of Mr Wolfe's concerns, is the UK legislation tighter than us? Or, you know, I mean, I, I find it quite difficult to get to grips with, with his actual objection to it, and I wasn't quite sure whether... He was saying we should have gone even further. We've done further than the UK legislation, but we should be going even further again. Or whether he was actually pointing out some deficiency in, in, the, in the approach from my, the Scottish government. If I make of you to respond to that point, I mean, my understanding is that the approach taken in Scotland, the approach taken in uh, England, is, is, is similar. And in that respect, we're not doing anything that hasn't been done in relation to RIPA in, in England. Indeed, we're, we're trying to ensure that we've got. Uh, Across, across the, the UK that we're reflecting the, the outcome of the decision in respect of Northern Ireland and, and responding to concerns about ECHR. Um, so in that respect, we, uh, we, we, we haven't done anything additional to, uh, to, to, to maybe upset um, uh, you know, faculty of advocates in that respect. I do understand the point that has been made by Mr Wolfe on behalf of faculty of advocates. I'm very grateful to Margaret Mitchell for reminding us that the majority, in fact, all of the... Uh, the respondents were broadly supportive of, of the, the approach we are taking here. Um, I do understand the concern uh, is, is a more general one about um, the, uh, the extent to which any uh, access should be given to client lawyer uh, discussions. And I think that's, that's the more fundamental issue that Mr Wolfe is, is directing his comments to. But presumably, Actually, that was already the case, because given that this legislation is actually improving the situation, it's currently the case. Indeed, that, yeah. that, that is my view, yeah, that so what we're doing is making it less likely, this, yeah. we're making it less likely yeah. that someone could have um, their, uh, their, their privileged discussions with their lawyer uh, contravened here in terms of the surveillance. Thank John, have you got a short one now? Or are you... um, uh, yes, I have indeed, and it is for the Minister, but perhaps more likely to be answered by Mr Walker, and it is about the, the reference made to the number of applications. Uh, would it be competent for any body out with Scotland to make application under this legislation? And could I ask Graham to address that? The bodies that can make application are, are named in, in RIPSA. Um, UK bodies will be caught by the, the equivalent order made under RIPA even if that was for, for surveillance operations in Scotland? It would depend what the surveillance operation were for. for. If it was for a reserve function, such as national security, then it would be made under RIPA. If it was for a serious criminal matter that straddled the, the border? If it was for a serious criminal matter, the likelihood would be that it would be Police Scotland that would be making the application. Were it the National Crime Agency, then the National Crime Agency would make that under the equivalent order made under RIPA. Because um, there's a provision within RIPA that recognises that some bodies function throughout the UK. Um, at the time RIPA was made, that was, well, previous to NCA, it was soccer. So rather than that UK wide body having to apply one regime for south of the border and a different regime for north of the border, it's acknowledged in RIPA that they operate UK wide and make their authorisations under RIPA. It goes through exactly the same process in terms of application, authorisation, and oversight. 
and, and can I ask who would be in charge of that criminal investigation in Scotland that relies on this legislation if it was uh, a UK body that was doing it? It would be the UK body that, is, that would be in charge of the... What role uh, would there be for the Lord Advocate? Whichever body applies for the, the activity would be the one that is responsible for it. Reporting to the Lord Advocate in Scotland? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can there be joint applications? Which would cover, if it was Police Scotland together with some UK, um, you know, straddling, yes, I mean, a uh, joint application? Yeah, an application could, could specify that, for example, Police Scotland and the NCA are working together. Okay. One of those bodies will take the lead and get in the authorities okay. in place. Thank you. Uh, Alison, followed by Christian. You. <clears throat> you said the Surveillance Commissioner had to authorise or not the application. Can you give the committee an indication of the number of applications that have been in the, the last year and, and any any refusals that there have been? We, we, we can't give that information, I'm afraid, to, to the committee. That's uh, information that is held by the uh, Commissioner. Um, and uh, as I understand, they have uh, in the past responded um, that they would not publish that information. Um, so we don't have access to it, I'm afraid, to provide to the committee today. So how are you able as Minister to understand whether or not this legislation um, is being um, appropriately applied? Well, um, clearly we uh, will have an ongoing uh, dialogue about the, uh, the, the imp implementation of the legislation. Um, I'm happy to come back to the committee uh, through, through written form, if I may convene, just about how the the, uh, we propose to, to, to undertake engagement with the Commissioner about the effectiveness of this legislation in due course. Um, but I don't know whether, if I can maybe ask Graham if there's been any discussion with the Commissioner about how they wish to take this forward at this stage. The Office of Surveillance Commissioner makes an annual report. Um, those reports are laid in the Scottish Parliament and the Parliament of Westminster. Um, so any, any indication that they're dissatisfied with the way things are working will most likely be set out in that annual report. Thank you. They provide, there are, there are figures provided in a number of tables at the end of the reports. Um, right. I'm not sure they will be as specific as the committee might want them to be. They wouldn't be broken down, I believe, I uh, imagine, to, 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 to Scotland versus other geographical territories? I think they are. Oh, they are? All right, okay. Yeah. We can maybe come back to the committee with, with information, pre previous examples, okay. if that would be helpful. Christian? A couple of clarification, if I may. Uh, I heard Margaret Mitchell uh, talking about uh, that uh, everybody agreed with the government, and uh, uh, it's, it's great to see that everybody accepts that as the government is going in the right direction. Uh, what, what, what I would like a clarification is on is how come everybody agrees, and yet uh, if it had not been for the case in Northern Ireland, nothing would have happened. Did any of his bodies make any recommendation beforehand? I, I'm not aware of anything, but if I can check with colleagues, um, maybe with Kevin Gibson, if he's aware of any previous concerns being raised prior to that case. No, I mean, I think that that's the first uh, example of uh, concerns being raised about this that we are, that we are aware of, and we responded as, as, as the UK government did to those concerns. I think it's a response to case law in this, in this instance. Obviously, some legislation, until it's tested, um, you're not entirely sure how uh, uh, noble gentlemen and ladies will, will actually interpret uh, the... Uh, uh, the legislation and so clearly in this case it was not picked up prior to that case being brought to court uh, and so you know in that respect everybody uh, had to respond to the, the the determination that was made in relation to the Northern Ireland case. Thank you for the answer. The second clarification is what Mr Kevin Gibson said about uh, this covert operation going into uh, uh, criminal laws going into uh, you said it was very unlikely that it would could you clarify this? Well, I mean, I can't really comment on what would happen in every individual case. Uh, I think the view that I would take in general terms would be that the information is unlikely to be capable of being used because, first of all, there's an arguable breach of somebody's right to remain silent, not to incriminate themselves. If their, uh, if their private discussions are recorded and uh, without, without their knowledge. And secondly, because the information that is obtained might be legally privileged, and legally privileged information is, uh, generally speaking, not permitted to be, or you're not required to disclose that in, in, in court proceedings. There would be no need to tighten up maybe the laws and make it clear? I think it's a separate issue, I think, about how the information is used uh, uh, later on. It's not something that is governed by this legislation particularly. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to conclude the question session there. I think we've really um, prized and exercised that one enough. Item five, move on to that, the agenda of the formal debate on the motions to approve the instruments considered under the previous item. I invite the Minister to move motion, <coughs> excuse me, S4M 11910. The Justice Committee recommends the draft regulatory of investigative powers, covert surveillance and property interference code of practice, Scotland Order 2015, be approved. Formally moved. Uh, we've not really asked questions, so I don't suspect any members want to debate that particular one. Is that agreed? agreed. Question is that motion S4M 11910 will be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. And I invite the Minister to move um, S4M 11915. The Justice <coughs> Committee recommends that the draft regulation of investigative powers and modification of authorisation provisions legal consultation Scotland Order 2015 be approved. On the move, Convener. Do any members wish to speak in the debate on the motion? Have we exhausted all the debating points in the... Yes, John. M merely to say that the, 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 the time that's been taken up with uh, this discussion, which has been very helpful, I think, indicates the level of concern there is about this whole issue. And I think it's been time well spent. Yes, I, I have to say that, I mean, I, <coughs> I'm, I'm now persuaded because of the fact that it's tightening matters up and, yes, the Human Rights Commission don't have concerns, but I think it was important to test the arguments, from my, um, from my point of view, put b b beside, uh, by the Dean of Faculty, and that these are markers so that we can see how things turn out and look forward to uh, further details uh, now that we've prized the things about the uh, Office of the Commissioner report. I think that's interesting measure and, and to look further into this. Um, anyone else wish to add anything to it? Right. Um, the question is that, that uh, motion S4M11915 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, are we? Yes, thank you. And I invite the Minister to move motion S4M11916. So the Justice Committee recommends that the draft regulation of investigative powers, covert human intelligence, sources, code of practice, Scotland Order 2015 be approved. Do any members, oh, sorry, Minister. Formally moved. Do any members wish to speak in the debate on the motion? No. The question is that motion S4M11916 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. As members are aware, we are required to report on all the affirmative instruments. The members can take the delegate of the responsibility for me to sign off the report on all three instruments. Thank you very much. I thank Cabinet Secretary's officials for attending today. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Item six on the agenda. Moving on. Next is consideration of three negative instruments. The first is the regulation of investigative powers, authorisation of covert human intelligence resources, Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014-339. This instrument alters the authorisation arrangements for the conduct or use of a covert human intelligence source under RIPSA. In certain cases, the DPLR committee did not draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. Do members have any comments to make in relation to this instrument? Silence. I'm taking silence as there are no comments. Are members content to make no recommendations in relation to this instrument? Yes. The second deck of instrument for our consideration is the mutual recognition of criminal financial penalties in the European Union, Scotland, number 2, order 2014, SSI 2014-36. This instrument gives effect to Framework Decision 2009-299-GHA and the application of the principle of mutual recognition to financial penalties. It aims to enhance procedural rights where financial penalties have been imposed at trial in the absence of persons concerned. The DPLR committee agreed to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument on the grounds that it breached the minimum period between the laying and coming into force of the instrument. That committee, however, was content with the explanation provided. Do members have any comments to make in relation to this instrument? Is there life out there? Yes. Can I just check which one we're on? We are on three, three, mutual <laughs> recognition of criminal financial penalties in the European Union. In other words, you recognise from other parts yeah. of other European... Countries. Well, just a brief comment, if I may. I'm, I'm pleased that we have the European arrest warrant um, in place to, to, um, because I think there could have been difficulties if these measures hadn't been picked up again, and that was something the committee had monitored over a period. But so I'm delighted that the UK government has seen sense on that. It's not really relevant, but you wanted to say it anyway, and you're well, feeling the better it was relevant, for it. But there you go. <laughs> um, um. You got that out of your system. Uh, so that's Mention the, the paragraph comment. 19 if that helps in the report. That's yeah, why I absolutely. That you correct me. Mm -hmm. uh, are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? Yeah. 
The third and final negative instrument for consideration for today is the mutual recognition of supervision measures in the European Union Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, 337. This gives effect to Framework Decision 2009 29 jha on the European Supervision Order, which promotes mutual recognition within the EU of judicial decisions relating to non-custodial pre-trial supervision measures that may be imposed on an accused person in criminal proceedings. Again, the DPLR Committee agreed to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument on the ground that it breached the minimum period between the laying and coming of the instrument, the committee was again satisfied with that exp an explanation given. Do you have any comments, Mr Finney, in relation to this? Well, I think it may be paragraph 19 in relation to that, which says um, <laughs> when the issuing state issues a warrant, an arrest warrant for breach of supervision measures, the European arrest warrant may be used to return the individual back to the uh, issuing state for trial. So I'm very pleased that we have You're that there. Thank Roddy? You. Yeah. To echo what John Finney said, but also to, to note that, that I think the committee was right to take his concerns over the opt, uh, opt back uh, seriously and to keep yeah. that under review. Yes. Right, so are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? Thank you very much. We now move into private session.